There's a gold mine waiting out there for the weekend adventurer, but our treasure isn't any kind of precious metal. We're searching for antique bottles right here on Treasure Search. years ago, no one had any idea what would become the collectibles of the future. And of all the unlikely candidates, who would have thought of the glass bottle? In all likelihood, that's exactly why the bottle has become such a popular collectible. In the past, the vast majority of all antique glass was either destroyed or discarded. Consequently, as a whole, old bottles are considered quite rare. There are many thousands of bottle collectors in the United States. And consequently, hundreds of clubs and societies from coast to coast that share an interest in antique glass. I first started collecting in 1972, and that was the year that I found out about the club. I'd gone to a flea market, met someone who was showing bottles and selling bottles, and got me started. Well, I've been collecting bottles uh, since the late 1960s, and uh, I started off just collecting Baltimore bottles, and I'm still con collecting only Baltimore bottles. Okay, the bottle collectors vary from uh, beer bottles to whiskey bottles to flask, uh, inkwells, and poison bottles. Like any commodity, value is based on supply and demand. If demand continues to rise and the supply is finite, unfortunately, commodities of that nature are soon priced out of the reach of the common man. They become a rich man's game. But take heart, antique bottle enthusiasts, because somewhere in every club, among the collectors and the dealers, you'll find a group who call themselves the Diggers. These adventurers are a stout, hearty bunch who get their kicks hitting the back roads in search of old dumping sites, dirt cellar floors, and river and stream banks that can yield discarded bottles. Without them, there are no new collectibles being brought to the market. From experience, the bottle diggers of America will readily admit that one of the best, and perhaps even the premier site for excavation, is one that the average person would be quite surprised by. We're talking about the privy. That's right, the old outhouse. Believe it or not, this architectural icon, a real American landmark, can hold a treasure trove of rare and valuable bottles. Of course, we're not actually talking about the outbuilding itself. In fact, with the introduction of indoor plumbing, the old privy was quickly phased out, and if you're under 25, there's a good chance you've never seen one. It's the shaft or the pit that was dug in the privy that lures the bottle hunter. For it seems that since our colonial ancestors began building outhouses, they used them as a convenient dumping spot for trash and debris, which included glass bottles. Privies are an ideal place to find the bottles because it was very common for them to take bottles out in those when they would go have a call of nature, go out there, have a sip or whatever, and they were through, they'd just dump it down into the hole down there. And so it became uh, a place that these bottles were entombed. Then uh, when they had to move the, the uh, privy, they would tend to fill it up with all bric-a-brac, of which you, you're seeing some of the things that they found, jugs, uh, marbles, and they, they just used to do anything down there in order to fill that hole up when he moved it to another hole, another position. Uh, everything from this table came from uh, the same two, two privies, outhouses, uh, that we found in Baltimore. These were actually dug about two weeks ago. This was the prize uh, right here. It's a uh, Randall & Company uh, soda bottle. And it's a pile soda bottle, probably dates from about 18, 1840s, late 1840s. Um, I guess value-wise, this will be a $1,000, $1,200 bottle. Yeah, the, um, the thing that makes this such a nice find is the fact that uh, um, this is a Baltimore bottle, and there have only been two other bottles of this type found in Baltimore, and both of those were broken. So you're looking at the only intact specimen dug in Baltimore. The marbles that were found are, uh, we found all the different types in this hole um, that there are to find 
And as far as collectors are concerned, the most valuable ones, uh, the most highly prized ones are the, um, the hand-painted marbles. And they're hard to come by, especially in this condition, again, which is why this was such a nice uh, dig. These right here are the, uh, these are the real bonuses from, um, from outhouse digging. Uh, besides the bottles, these are the, these are the things that uh, are the gravy, so to speak, on, on, the, uh, on the hole. Now there's other items too that are found, coins, things like that, but the hand-painted marbles, uh, they're some of the nicer things to find, especially in this condition right here. Both these bottles are what privy diggers call tear jerkers. Uh, these are bottles that would have been real prizes if they weren't broken. Unfortunately, they're rarely found even like this, and when they are found, they're broken. Uh, this right here was another, this was a Baltimore medicine bottle. Uh, it's also pondled. You can see the pondle on the bottom. Although nearly everything thrown away in the past was biodegradable, fortunately the glass was not. And today, searchers seek the old privies in earnest to excavate the treasures they hold deep beneath the soil. We're about to make a treasure strike, and you don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. And now, back to our search for antique glass. I'm here in one of the rooms of the Boonesboro Museum of History, where we've recreated an old-time country store. As you can see, bottles were an important part of the food industry and the pharmaceuticals and, of course, the whiskey business. Today, these bottles are highly collectible antiques. Out in the field, it's early morning in December, and Harry Bittinger has teamed up with a small group who specialize in privy digs. They first do a lot of research to zero in on promising sites, but it's the actual field work that pinpoints the exact location and makes the excavation successful. I got interested in bottle hunting. Uh, I was working at Western Auto out in Owens Mills about, about 13 years ago, 14 years ago now. And a, a fellow down the street from me had bought a metal detector. He worked for the State Roads Commission. And he didn't know how to use the metal detector. So I was at the house. He came up and asked me if I could show him how to use the metal detector. And I said, yeah. And I took him out, showed him how to use it. And in return, he said to me, would you like to go out and dig an outhouse with me? And I said to him, an outhouse? I was figuring something like a Johnny on the spot. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. He said, no, I'm talking about one that they used in the 1800s. And I said, well, yeah, that sounds like it might be fun. So I went out one Friday evening with him, and we were over in South Baltimore, Montgomery Street. They were rehabilitating the whole neighborhood, and I dug my first outhouse, and I've been digging almost every weekend for 14 years. They know what to look for. A little bit of common sense goes a long way here. You won't find a privy without a home, or at least the site where a home once stood. And you can bet that the little outbuilding will be pretty close to the residence. After all, it was still used even during the coldest times of the year. Privy hunters look for a depression in the ground where the soil has settled as the debris in the pit has degraded. This depression is a prime indicator. The searchers use steel T rods to probe the pit for clues. They can actually hear and feel bottles with the tip of the rod. And basically what we do is we just bust a little hole and we have a probe, we stick the probe in the ground and we feel the difference in the texture of the clay and determine whether we're in an outhouse or not. And then when we determine that we're in one, we just finish busting it open and just dig it until we get into the, into the trash layer and then to the bottom of it. And then we fill it back in, sweep it up a little bit and, and lay the black top back down. That's basically what we're out here for today. But once the excavation begins, it's time to use their greatest virtue, patience.
we're standing beside here is an excavated brick line privy. And over there, they're filling in a what is known as a barrel line privy. These are materials they used in the 18th and 19th century to line specific shafts for privies, wells, etc. And what I have here is a 18th and to mid 19th century oak barrel with sapling staves that they used to line these privies with. We use a probe, stainless steel, and in probing the ground, we're looking for the walls. We generally penetrate the rotten walls of these barrels and come up with wood that gives us an indicator that there is a barrel down there and a privy. And hard work and determination can pay off big, as our searchers prove when they reach their magic level in the pit. I've been doing this for about 14 years now, 13, 14 years in that area there. And uh, a friend of mine named John Grimm, him and I started digging together. And he, digging with him, really got me hooked into this. And then I joined the Antique Bottle Club with him, and him and I were digging every weekend for a while there. Then we started pairing off with different people. And then I met with Jeff Strong over here to, in the green, and I've been digging with Jeff for going on 11 years now. Every weekend we were together. And then I met Tom Butler about almost two years ago now through uh, buying a, purchasing a bottle. And I got him hooked on to, to digging with us. And then Chris here was digging with, is digging with a guy named Tim who couldn't be with us today. And uh, we, we thought we needed a fourth guy out here today. So we invited Chris and there's a great bunch of guys to dig with. And they're all crazy like me. So it makes it even more better. have been buried for a very long time and their beauty may not be so apparent as they're lifted from the soil but a little elbow grease can change that very quickly when treasure search returns we'll get some super tips on bottle cleaning and restoration and now back to treasure search with bob denver what we have here after we dig, uh, we have a tendency to try to clean up our specimens of bottles and insulators and such. And one of the things we do is we sort it out by size and shapes and uh, put it in a rinse, home remedy type rinse of this uh, washing fluid. And we let it soak for a while to uh, get the dirt and other excess material off of it. And then, well, we'll take one here, such as this clean it out real well. Then we'll take it and uh, perhaps if it needs to be cleaned on the inside, we'll use the home remedy brushes, bottle brushes as they're known, to run down the inside to clean out the inside. Well, in some cases, we're not as lucky as that. We'll get a specimen that the inside of the bottle is not quite as clean as we can get it with a brush. And uh, let me pour the water out of this so I can what we'll use in this case, we'll put up some copper BBs on the inside of the bottle, which will act as a scoring agent. And we'll roll the BBs around in there, which takes some of the material out of the inside of the bottle without harming the bottle most of the time. And we'll pour that out and put that in the rinse also. Okay, here we have one that is highly stained. And a lot of bottle collectors and diggers don't mind to have the oxidation. That's what this is called, oxidation on the glass. A lot of bottle diggers don't mind having it. But for those who do, what we can always do is we take a little bit of petroleum jelly, or you can use cooking oil, whichever is you like. And you take a little bit of the petroleum jelly and just kind of dab it on the glass, rub it in the glass a little bit, and, and let it rub it real well. And it doesn't last forever. You have to, if you want to keep the shine on it, you have to keep rubbing the petroleum jelly with you all. And what happens is you get a little bit of a shine on the bottle and it takes some of the sickness off of it. There are other kind of professional ways of cleaning bottles. Uh, these are home remedies and work very well for excavated examples. So where do these nice, clean and shiny antique bottles get shown off? Where else? At an antique bottle convention.
dealers, collectors, and diggers get together at these shows to buy, sell, and trade. It's the perfect place for the glass enthusiast to meet others in the hobby and share information. Bottle hunting and bottle collecting is really big. It cuts across the whole cross section in the United States as well as worldwide. In our show that we have, we have um, I think approximately 13, 14 states, three countries representative, Canada, uh, England, and one year I think we even had somebody from Australia. We'll continue our search for antique glass right after this. To fuel this tremendous growing hobby, our bottle diggers are finding new sites each and every day and bringing back rare and sometimes even unique samples of old glass. Well, every bottle hunter has his, has his dream of what he wants to find. I, my idea is a J.L. Hamilton preparation in green. That would be the ideal find. The J.L. Hamilton preparation is an 1840-1845 medicine from Baltimore. It's, it's been found, but never in green. And uh, that's just my idea of an ideal bottle. If I could dig one of those up one day and have it sitting on my shelf, it would be like a dream come true. My personal dream would be to find an ILM Smith wine seal bottle complete, which is marked Baltimore. That would do it for me. It would be absolutely as far as you could go, as far as my collecting interest is concerned. Okay, as you can see, I just got back from, from the day's dig, and I'm gonna start out showing you some of, the, some of the stuff that I have dug throughout the years. This is a Dr. Bates Centennial Tonic Bitter uh, Beer, dated 1876. This is the second one I had ever dug. The first one we dug had a lip chip in it and we, I wasn't able to keep it. But this one we dug up over in East Baltimore. And it was in a, it was in a uh, oval brick line outhouse. And it was on a real hot, hot day. And this is one of Baltimore's good bottles. Exceptional bottles. All, anybody that collects bottles is always trying to get one of these. So this is a real good bottle. Okay. And the next thing I go to is, this is a Cornflower Blue Torpedo, unfortunately, no name or anything on it. We were walking along on a construction site up on Lombard Street. One day, I, I imagine it's been about eight years ago, they tore down a few buildings and we walked along the site and found a couple outhouses and there wasn't anything in it. And we were getting ready to leave and as we were getting ready to walk away, we looked over in the corner and we spotted another outhouse that they had they had it completely cut it all away except for maybe two foot of it. And it was like 10 degrees that day and we got down into it and it was only a real little bit of a trash layer. And the first time I'd ever found a torpedo was this one here. And like I said, unfortunately it's not embossed, but it is still such a beautiful color and it is a good bottle to keep. But their treasure adventures can also yield some bonus items that turn up at dumping sites and privies and add even more spice to the thrill of discovery. this for a bonus. There's usually more than one privy hole at most of the productive sites, because once the hole was filled with debris, another one was dug for a new house close by. So here we go again. Good luck, fellas.